Hey, today is July 31st, 2017. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 51. Today, we'll just see how boring Elon Musk's new uh, venture is, what Disney is doing recording your face, and how to make those 80s music videos on your smartphone and more. Have a seat on a magic bench because Human Factors Cast starts right now. Let's do it. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today from across the pond by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. What is going on, everybody? There he is. It's 1.30 Blake's time. He is making a tremendous sacrifice to be here with us today. Oh, it is always <laughs> a pleasure to be here. Nick, how are you, man? Man, I'm good. I'm good. We had a couple of technical difficulties at the top of the show, but we're all good now. How are you, buddy? Oh, just loving life. It's, uh, it is a beautiful summer out here in Ireland, that is for sure. Uh, but you know, man, I've been doing a fair amount of traveling, and you know what I haven't used in probably 10 years is an actual, like, Garmin GPS unit. Oh, yeah, I, I used to have one of those, or I guess it was my, my dad's, um, but yeah, I remember the UI being pretty clunky and, and, uh, and not so great. Yeah, and so my dad, or, like, my stepdad's super obsessed with using the thing, and I just, uh, like, navigation for me, and I feel like for a lot of people, it's been become like synonymous with google maps or something through my phone but you it's it surprised the heck out of me that the garmin's ui has like changed none it's it's just that still that little toy monster truck that's following (laughs) the pink line is it now Um, are the controls all still blocky oh they are like it's it really hasn't changed any the only thing that has changed is the notifications that it gives you and the like more in-depth details that it gives when you're driving on the road um something they have out here in ireland that i don't know if they have in the states or i've never come across it is they actually have vans that have cameras inside of them that are the speed trap cameras oh so what you'll what you'll get is you'll get like certain areas of the road where you'll get a lot of alerts like hey you'll have a speed tra- a possibility of a speed trap van uh, for this like stretch of road um so that was kind of that was kind of cool but also they had um a great feature, especially for because we're like driving on the wrong side of the road or the side of the road that we're not used to. Um, but they had like a lot of like what lane you need to be in and when you're going to turn off and all that kind of good stuff. So like even though the UI hasn't in- improved at all, some of the information that it is able to right. transmit is a lot better and a lot more useful than it used to be. But yeah. I thought it was crazy that it's it's at least been ten years since I looked at one. And not much has changed. Yeah, the same. I'll have to I'll have to revisit it next time I'm in uh, an electronic store. I, I do have a question though. Like, how is the um, I guess the hardware? Because I remember this this clunky capacitive touch screen or not capacitive. Sorry, it was um the uh, what's the one where you press the thin layer of film that presses the layer below? Is that no, that's not capacitive. Capacitive oh, is like what we have on our phone. I don't... Yeah, yeah, it's like pressure, that, pressure touchscreen, right? Do they still? Yeah, have those? the pressure touchscreen. It's a lot better. Like the touchscreen's not as not as like you have to bear down on it. Um, but I mean, a lot of the a lot of like the UI controls haven't changed at all. So it's the same. The only real improvement is maybe the hardware of the screen well, <laughs> uh, yeah, versus I mean, any kind of like navigation changes. Well, I mean, you know, they're they're making some strides, but uh, sounds like they need some. Uh, some human factors folks over there making making some strides in the uh <laughs> they probably do they probably do have some human factors folks working on they're hard at work and the the improvements that we see probably we just don't notice i mean yeah i think it's much more like software and algorithm based than anything like playing yeah. with the ui for sure for sure uh well i gotta tell you man i uh, over this last week i've uh a lot of people have been talking about this black mirror series have you heard about this blake Oh yeah, you you watch it? Uh, I have seen the first uh, three episodes of okay. season one. I haven't seen any of season two. Okay, so uh, so to to fill our listeners in who are not familiar with this, it's, it, it people equate it's an unfair equation that people make where it is uh, this generation's Twilight Zone and and how it kind of 
uh, but it's technology based. the 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 premise I like to to say here is it's it's kind of how do we deal with these moral moral implications of inter- interacting with technology, and what are some what if scenarios if you know the future were to take a turn uh, for the worse with te- the technology available, right? So without getting into any spoilers, I've been watching this and I've been really enjoying it. And uh, I just I just wanted to shout it out because it's it's been a pretty good uh, pretty good series so far. It's, it's very bingeable. <laughs> it, yeah, it is. It's a super twisted thriller of something to watch, and it is the best part about it is even though some of the stuff is graphic, it it's always mind bending in a way that makes you really think about the message. Because I've had to rewatch the f- only three that I've seen. I've watched them all twice at least. Just yeah. to like really kind of grasp what they were getting at or what was going on in the episode that I might have missed. And so you know, honest, I'd, I'd recommend it too. Honestly, I watched the first episode and about ten minutes in, I was like, "You can't be serious." And to yeah, any <laughs> anyone who's anyone who's seen this ten minutes in, they know exactly what I'm talking about. But I, I was like, "You cannot be serious. This this show cannot be as good as everyone's saying because of this." And. Uh, you know, the first episode I would argue is probably the worst episode of the series, and uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll second that for sure. Yeah. So I mean, uh, stick with it; it's it's okay. Uh, Blake, you have hotel iPad esque travel directory on here. Is that something different from your Garmin? Oh yeah. So this is something I have actually never seen before, but it was probably the coolest thing, especially if you're traveling abroad. Um, but we we were staying. I went down to kind of the southern coast of Ireland, or at least I, that's what I would call it. And it's in a city called Cork. Um, but anyway, I checked in the hotel, and I didn't really know anything about where I was, like what restaurants were there, what bars were good, uh, clubs or anything there around. So in the center of where you check in, there's like this. It's much bigger than an iPad, so I'd say it's probably like a fifteen by fifteen screen. That's just kind of like standing in the middle of of the uh, reception area. So but it's like anyway, a, is it, it, it is basically it, like, is it like a laptop size screen more than uh, a tablet? Yeah, but it's just like a, a really big flat touch screen. Got it. Um, and it was just laid out and like just showed you or just gave you basically like a really simple menu, kind of like like uh, like Yelp that you could just dig down into of restaurants, bars, uh, historical stuff and in the town places to go and it would give you like information about specific places plus maps to where you needed to go walking. Um, but also like in, in I think about 12 different languages cause you get a bunch of being in Europe, you get a lot more variation in what people speak and don't speak. Sure. Um, sure. I thought it was really cool. Uh, cause sometimes you, you can like ask, um, receptionist or whatever, but this like gave you directions and you could send the, Google Maps stuff right to your phone over the Wi-Fi, so it was pretty sick. Now, I'm assuming this is tailored specifically for the area that you're around. I mean, uh, it was does this seem like it was built from the ground up to sort of accommodate this uh, geographic location, or uh, does it does it seem like a service that they're tapping into different APIs that kind of uh, give you that information? Um, so from what I could tell, cause it's obviously like a, a networked company through this specific hotel, okay. but it was definitely tailor made for this specific location. And I would assume that like, uh, the majority of the software, so the UI, how it works any of that kind of stuff is all the same across every location, but it'll be different based on where you are. Right. But yeah, definitely just like tailor made to the city, the specific city in this case, Cork. Well, that's cool, man. Uh, so, I gotta, I gotta. Okay, I want to talk about one more thing before we get into the news. Uh, RNG. Are you familiar with RNG? If it is random number generator, yes, you if got not, it. No, no, you got it, man. So let me tell you. So there are a couple games out there, and I'm not going to name names, but there. <laughs> I mean, okay. So no, I'm not. But there are. Let me just. I want to talk about the UX of RNG. Or the human factors behind it, because honestly, there are some implications behind it that, you know, really sort of impact uh, a way somebody plays a game, right? So, let me just say, in this game that I'm currently playing, there is a shop, right? And in this shop, 
the uh oh man how do i describe this without like giving away the game in this shop there are certain things available and each thing that is available is randomized right so this is the rng component of it now yeah, sure. I, I am currently trying to get enough of a certain thing to unlock that thing right so you have to get x amount of are you getting like kind of like some sort of currency to help you unlock what you want kind of yes yeah let's think gotcha. about it that way and uh it's very random as to when this very specific item shows up in this store and it is very discouraging because i am like two purchases away from being able to unlock this thing and i've been i need 50 of these things and i have 46 and i've been i've been farming it for about uh, uh a month right and then just out of nowhere oh, it wow just, that's it a just, long time it just stops and i haven't it's been about a month since i've seen one so i i'm on my second month stretch and i got 46 of them and then rng has just made it impossible for me to unlock this thing where a ton of other things become available to me once this thing is unlocked and i know i'm talking about this in very very broad, ambiguous terms. I don't want to upset anybody's feelings if they listen to the show. But man, there is a real issue with RNG. <laughs> I mean, that oh, needs to be addressed. That's like a really um, interesting point. Because I'll, th- I'll not throw anybody under the bus because I'm just not good at the game. But I ran into this similar issue you're talking about in Diablo 3 when it came out at first. Like trying to get specific tiered gear, you, it was just nearly oh, yeah. impossible, and you felt like you were never going to get there. And sometimes you never did because it's just random drops, and you could only farm something for so long before they like nerf the area or change the mechanics so the RNG was just never going to be in your favor. Yeah, and that's part of the reason why I'm choosing to leave it anonymous is because this isn't just an issue in this game that I'm currently playing; it's an issue in a lot of games, right? So you have, but. So, so like, let's take Overwatch for an example. That's not the game I'm talking about here, but let's take it as an example because Blizzard is actively trying to get around this whole RNG element, right? People unlock these skins for their characters that they then uh, already own, and so they give them um, they give them currency which they can buy other skins, right? That's fine. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. But what Blizzard is doing is they're kind of approaching this and saying, okay, well, let's tweak the algorithm and, you know, weight it in such a way that they will get less of the things that they already own because that's discouraging, right? So there are yeah, ways yeah. There are ways that behind the scenes you can tweak these things to, to make it better for the user. Yeah, but it, it, actually that that makes me think that it must be I don't know. It must be a tougher concept to broach because one one <laughs> one specific game that has got really bad reviews about that is like the newest Modern Warfare, where like you you have a similar thing that if you get repeat skins, cards, whatever, you get a piece of like salvage, which is currency. But the amount of times that you end up getting salvage or like getting doubles or triples of things you already have is so sure. often that it's kind of it's kind of insane. Uh, so I wonder, like, what the uh, depending on, like, I guess how many items, how many expansions you put on there, what really the intensity of building the RNG to make sure that it can kind of, I guess, learn what it's given a specific player and still stay random. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I have to say, like, there's a whole subreddit devel- uh, uh, dedicated to this game that I'm playing, and you know, anytime someone's like, "Did so and so disappear from the sh- the store?" Uh, people are like. <laughs> Nope, it's just RNG. And so there's this whole uh, RNG has become the butt of the joke. So anyway, I think uh, <laughs> I spent enough time ranting about RNG. I think we got to get into the Human Factors news. What do you think, Blake? Oh, let's do it, man. All right. So this is the show all about Human Factors news. This could be anything from, uh, you know, whatever it is. Disney, if that's Human Factors, we can cover that. <laughs> Elon Musk, boring company. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Magnet hacks that unlock guns? Yeah, it's all in there. Virtual reality, whatever it is. As long as it relates to the field of human factors, it's all fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right, so let's start. Let's kick it off with Elon Musk. So Elon Musk's boring company is a step closer to becoming a reality. 
The idea developed in response to the pain of clogged up roads and traffic jams with the basic premise being that underground tunnels can transport vehicles from point A to point B more quickly and efficiently than roads and without as much traffic jams. A car, so a car, in this case, would drive into a collection point located on the surface of a road, after which it is taken underground via an elevator and moved to its desired destination using a slit on wheels transver- traversing a network of underground tunnels. So must share this idea of the elevator last month, saying at the time that it was close to operational, and now he's published footage of the first car elevator in action. Now, of course, the tunnel networks themselves will take more time to complete, but it's a sign that this ambitious project is moving forward with some serious speed. Now, Nick, I remember you pointing out to the, or you put the story in the queue for us, and I watched the video that looked just so unreal of cars disappearing down under the street flying through tunnels and what just seemed to be, I don't know, some some kind of fifth element network of <laughs> travel. I can't believe that they're already showing a, I guess what they're calling a car elevator working now. Yeah, uh, I'm a little blown away by the speed of development as well. Um, and I mean, you can see in the background of this video that you can check out in the original article, you can see in the background, they clearly have pieces that they are building tunnels with um, a couple sort of things about the design of this elevator, man. Uh, I know, I know it's just a prototype, so please don't email me. I know this is just my thoughts, but there, okay. So there's no, there's no rails. There's also no sort of um, locking mechanism for the car to sort of hold the car on the platform, right? So once it zooms off, right? There's, there's also no feedback for the user whenever they are close enough to the edge of the thing so they're not driving too forward so the lip of the car doesn't get hit when they come down now what is being shown here is a tesla uh being loaded onto this thing so one could argue that this is a fully automated process the human is not involved and if that's the case fine but this is a human factors podcast and so we want to make sure we address these kinds of issues like what kind of feedback does the user get the driver get in this case as he is approaching this I see nothing. It's like your best guess. Yeah, and that's super dangerous. And the you bring up a good point <laughs> that in the video and even in uh, the test stuff, it's a Tesla. So I'm not sure is like the real driving factor behind this that there is going to be automation and cars involved. Right. That I mean, that allow this to be easier. But what are you going to do for the majority of people who don't drive Teslas, or are they allowed to get on these things? Yeah, how do I get my Toyota Corolla on this thing? <laughs> I just drive it yeah, up and like. And the oh. funny part is, is, you brought up there being issues like this before, like before we even saw this. I guess this full, fully functional um, elevator car. Like you talked about there not being really anything to catch you from stopping or showing where you were on it. So it's, it's kind of surprising that they've gone from like concept to developed piece without thinking this through. But I, mean, I, think, I have faith. I think what they're testing here is obviously the hardware. Uh, that, so they're, they're testing the elevator and the fact that the elevator works fine. I still want to bring these issues because I'm sure, I'm sure Elon Musk, our golden boy, is uh, out there thinking of ways in order to make this the safest thing possible because if... It's a disaster. His name is attached to it. And also, uh, you know, there, it, it's just these types of things that we have to think about as human factors professionals when we when we develop these feats of engineering. Like, this is, this is awesome. This is so cool. But we do have to take into consideration, you know, what happens when there's actually somebody behind the thing. Like, I'm sure they'll test this and, and find this really quick, that there's a lack of feedback and all that stuff. So... Well, the the other thing too is like you you brought up a good point with there being no real locking mechanism because if there's not, these things are supposed to travel really fast in a forward direction and then basically stop and go directly vertical. So I feel like if the if the car is not locked in properly where it is, it's either going to jerk forward or pop up off the ground by going up back to the surface of the street sure so i it'll be interesting if they show any kind of real like prototype testing 
of like once a once one of these tunnels is fully installed. Yeah, and you know, okay, so you brought up another point. Like, okay, it's not it's not secure. It's not secure. Uh, I'm sure they'll have some sort of mechanism that comes up, and there's AI involved that you know looks at the axle and then hooks around it and then brings it down. But like, what happens if there's like a a, a rat? gets down in these systems, right? And uh, it's, like, right in the way of one of these traveling platforms. Like, what happens then? There's a, there's a bunch of what-ifs that I'm sure we'll find out uh, once this thing comes. But I, I thought this was important to talk about just because it's it's kind of the future of transportation. We don't talk a whole lot. I mean, we try to we try to talk about transportation on the show, but it's it's rare that we see these novel ideas that sort of are transformative of uh, sort of transit. Yeah, and it, it's kind of crazy that, like, when I, when I think of this, I feel more like I'm thinking of a train that's moving really fast, because I guess because it's underground and it's not as congested as a road. Um, and I guess when I think of Elon Musk, you get that kind of Tony Stark persona behind him where he's oh, yeah. just pushing things to the future. So a lot of times when I think of him, I'm like, okay, this guy's going to make flying cars and it will look like the fifth element out here. But this is obviously very well thought through. Um, And again, I mean, you and I see these things that maybe designers of prototypes don't see. And this is like a bit, these are big pieces of hardware uh, that are going to, I don't know, again, have tons of implications for how people travel and safety will be a big deal so Ooh, that's why we point these, out these things what if one of these elevators fails Woof. well it's it's so it's almost a matter of when right because yeah. this is such a brand new idea oh, and you God. i mean you brought up a perfect point with the rat like obviously they're gonna have to have to have a lot of sensors attached to these rails and it'll be no matter how much planning you do it'll be a lot of learning curve type stuff when this is actually in uh, implementation. So I don't, I don't know. This is, this is just like a whole new can of worms. Oh, for sure. Uh, by putting this giant underground tunnel system. in. Hey Blake, do you have this thing up on repeat? Are you watching this right now? Uh, I can't. I'm actually doing all this through my phone. Oh, right now. Okay. Well, okay. It, on the video, did you notice that how, how close the back end of this vehicle is to the edge? Like, yeah, it is. The, very it, there's close. like, yeah, there's almost like no room for clearance or error, uh-uh. which makes me think you're right. There, there's got to be a lot of automation. They're thinking it's going to be baked into this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's an interesting one. Let's go ahead and move on to our next story. All right. So this is crazy. So a, a Disney story coming up. So the Walt a Disney few. Company is now employing artificial intelligence and facial recognition to determine how much audiences enjoy every single moment of their films. So at IEEE's Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition last weekend, Disney Research and Caltech explained their technique for tracking the facial expressions of people watching movies. The research team calls their new algorithm, algorithm factorized variational auto encoder encoders and claim the technology is so effective at recognizing complex expressions that after analyzing a single audience member's face for about 10 minutes, the algorithm can then predict even that faces future expressions throughout the remainder of the film. It will be interesting to see how Disney uses this data to collect their collecting from tracking audience faces as, as this AI f- tracking system could help them understand audience reactions much better than human market researchers. And I won't lie, that last line kind of scares me because that's par- partially Ooh. what I've done in the past is doing some market research. Uh, so AI is now dipping into some of the research aspects of what human factors people, people do. But nonetheless, it's crazy that Disney is using this kind of facial recognition for their stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, wow. I don't even, huh, dude, I don't even know where to start with this one. I, I'm literally at a loss of where to start. Okay. So, so Disney has this technology that allows them to look at an audience, analyze their facial features and see whether or not they're having a good time or a really good time 
and how they're reacting to what's on screen. And to take it a step further, they can then, once they have sort of uh, an idea of what your taste is, they can predict your reaction to the rest of the movie. Holy Which crap. Is, I know, that is, that's beyond comprehension to me, because they're claiming that this can all be done within 10 minutes of monitoring somebody's facial expressions, basically. Holy crap. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about how they do this, right? So they built a database, and they, they kind of they, they took existing movies and fed it into a neural network, right? So they did this um, by pointing an infrared camera at the audience, and um, they did it over 150 showings of nine movies, right? So Star Wars Force Awakens, if they were in on me, they would have seen me smiling the whole time, except for when uh, it's been out a year, whatever. It's been out two years, except for when Han Solo dies. Oh, my God, my face just tears <laughs> uh zootopia inside out big hero six and i mean to be fair they have a good they have a I, I love disney's catalog and these are all great movies so it'd be interesting to see like you know how how audiences reacted to a, a movie that wasn't critically acclaimed um something like the lone ranger or something for example that was like a flop and you know they they acknowledged that it was a flop how how does an audience react to that, and can they go the other way too? Can they can they then test? Uh, they can see neutral, but can they see negative emotion as well? It'd be interesting to see. Yeah, you've it's uh I don't know. It's very interesting <laughs> to me that like the way that they even built this database, just using their own back catalog, but it just doesn't seem like they you they had to use that much. Or, gather that much data to make this thing as robust and far as its predictability. Cause I mean, it talks about it used the, it used like nine specific movies and only 150 showings. Now, like, I don't know how many people are in movie theaters these days. Cause I know some of them got a lot smaller, but still for this thing to be able to within 10 minutes, start predicting how you're going to react to what's upcoming. It, it just doesn't even almost seem feasible in some way well that's based on the data that they got right so they they were constantly comparing the data that they got to the data that they got from the same people and were able to see the trends over time and so then they just apply that algorithm to the viewing audiences now the part that scares me is the fact that this could be like you said this this is uh this has the potential to be much better than human market researchers because they can do a focus group and say, oh, that joke didn't work. Let's do ADR on this animated film and change that joke and test it again until it's the perfect joke, right? Like, or, or, or even with advertising, you know, you can see how people react to an advertisement. And if they're not jiving with it, then scrap it. Let's do it again. And it's just the, the applications of something like this. Uh, we're getting into that whole tailored advertisement, like, what if an advertisement that's directed at me and, you know, there's facial recognition, they're using an algorithm. They could do this probably with the camera on my laptop or, you know, on my phone or whatever it is. So they analyze my face and then they, they log the response to that I had to that, that uh, advertisement. And then the next time they know not to give me something that's like that based on my facial expressions. Oh, surely. And I mean, they could just basically develop personas for each type of ad they run. Because, I mean, some things are going to be successful with some people. And, I mean, think about this could even change what a focus group means. It could be just running these small little tests. Because, I mean, you know how, supposedly, you know how simple it is to take control of somebody's camera on their phone. Well, I mean, if you, if you, <laughs> we've talked about this on the show before where companies hide things in their terms and services agreement. I mean, if that becomes part of it, they are accessing your, you know, camera on your phone to kind of determine how you react to anything that's within their own application. It could help you learn how to either build better advertising, build better experiences through your phones, all through just AI and facial recognition. Right. Oh. All right. Well, I well, I don't want to talk about this anymore. But uh, Disney's doing some other work, right? <laughs> yes. Th- this is this is a little more lighthearted for sure. Not I think as much so. Let's, let's sinister keeping your face logged. Oh, yeah. All right. So augmented 
augmented and mixed reality experiences tend to be solo affairs. So you're either looking at your phone or you're wearing a headset. Well, for Disney research, this is not nearly social enough. So it's scientists have created the magic bench. So this is a blend of augmented and mixed reality that entire groups can share together. So the bench uses a combination of a camera and a depth sensor to produce a 3D recreation of you and the bench, letting virtual characters and objects interact with you as if they were actually there in the space you're in. And the key to this is the actual sitting. So it can tell the system how many people are present, where they're facing, and vibrate when a digital actor actually sits down with you. Now, this is something I can get behind with Disney. And, you know, I really never thought about the – because we talk about, I think, almost every week about different expanses in VR and augmented reality. It's hard not to when I'm on the show. I know, (laughs) right? But but the – so the entertainment aspect in something like a theme park is just a great way to I th- I think not only use the technology but expand upon it because like th- like this article is talking about with this magic bench it's combining both augmented reality and what they call mixed reality experiences. Yeah, and so so one sort of uh, one thing that comes to my mind uh, right off the bat you've gone to Disneyland. Oh, you know it. You've gone to the haunted mansion. Yes. Well, yeah, they could totally do something with the ghosts in in those doom buggies with this technology. Yeah, you know, I feel like that's where a lot of this will go. They start doing little tests, and then it's going to be much more immersive in each oh, one yeah. of these rides. Now, let me let me sort of uh, the the whole point of this article is that they want to make it a social experience, right? A shared experience between multiple people in the same space. So, what they're getting at here is, uh, you know, more than one person on a bench interacting with this thing that's going on in the environment in their own special way. And then it, the environment responding to those things. Right. So the thing that I'm thinking of is, so when I went to this, uh, this human body exhibit a couple of weeks ago, I talked about it on the show. Uh, there was a augmented reality experience where you, a camera sort of looks at you and projects onto the screen in front of you your your body, and it shows you your locomotion with your bones and everything. And now, how uh, it was a single person experience where the one person would get up, and the cameras would map them, and then you move your thing. How cool would it be to have a interactive experience with multiple people? Right, you could get the dancing skeletons up there, whatever you know, something like that. Just in everyday life, uh, would be would be pretty cool. I think. I don't know. I think it would be great, and you know, like I've I've often thought about like where the future of VR goes in terms of like social interaction across kind of the internet, more so. Like you strap on your right. headset and you are in like virtual space with avatars that are your friends and all that kind of stuff. But this takes it to a completely different level to where you're actual people in the same room experiencing the same things together and not necessarily with like any kind of headset wear on. Cause they even talk about in the article that this is done through like a mirror projection um, into the room. So not necessarily requiring any kind of headset. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's a mirror. I was going to say it's a mirror. So they're they're looking at a mirror and interacting with everything on there. But I mean, who knows what the future holds? What what who's to say like if everybody puts on a set of glasses and they see mixed reality in front of them that they wouldn't be able to interact with the same things, right? This this uh 3D creature character is running around the environment and everybody is able to see where it is um you know, using the same headsets and position track. Like there's there's a ton more uh th- this is the first step to a larger social shared augmented reality experience, in my opinion. I think you're right. And, you know, if you, if you kind of abstract it a little bit, I think Disney's been doing this with their theme parks for a long time, like oh, as yeah. far as providing an augmented reality, not in the sense that we think of it right now, but, like, I don't know, if you're – if you're in a room and you feel like a gust of wind come at you because of something you're seeing on the screen is wind. I think what's always been lacking is the visual immersion, but they've been good at creating the scene through your different tactile senses. Sure. So now that the visual aspect's really catching up, I, I feel like we're only going to see more intensive 
experiences like this one. Well, I think I think you bring up a good point is that Disney's been doing this for a long time. I think augmented reality could mean anything that sort of uh, enhances your view of where you're at in the world, right? So, like, I'm thinking even going into Star Tours and seeing all the robots, you know, all the droids moving around and uh, all, the environment itself could be an augmented reality experience because I'm no longer in the real world. I am in a galaxy far, far away, right? Like, I'm there with all these other people on a Star Tour ride. So I, I think... Oh, yeah. Like, it, that'd be awesome. Yeah, we're, we're kind of skirting the definition of augmented reality right now. But anyway, this article is pretty cool. Do you have anything else uh, closing on this one here? Oh, I really don't on this one. All right. So I just want to do a quick thank you to our friends over at Engadget, Gizmodo, Wired, and Recode for all our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along as we find these articles, you can follow us on all our social media links for the links uh, to those as we find them. Uh, It's always a good way to sort of uh, stay updated with what we're going to be talking about on the show as well as, uh, you know, being able to see what we're talking about. So, Blake. All right, Nick, you ready to jump into the 80s? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, so AHA's classic video for Take Me On was the result of a painstaking effort. So it took a total of 16 weeks to rotoscope the frames, creating the signature blend between the real and hand-drawn worlds. Now, however, you only need an iPhone to recreate the same look for yourself. Trixic Studios has shown off an augmented reality iOS app that produces the take on me look in your own home the proof of concept software makes do with virtual reality versions of aha's morton harkett harkett and the pipe wielding thugs but its effect is more convincing than you might think in many ways the app which unfortunately is not publicly available is a showcase of how easily how easy it's becoming to implement augmented reality heavy augmented reality this week yeah (laughs) <laughs> I like it. I like it. I, I don't know. I like where this is going. Now, this was cool because I, I've been reading a whole bunch on Twitter and Medium about Apple, a- Apple, <laughs> Apple's AR kit and how easy it is to just grab it um, from just like the App Store and start developing in it. Uh, the only problem now is I don't have a Mac to use it with anymore, but obviously they're, you're able to do really complex things with it with such a simple framework. <laughs> yeah this uh oh man this is impressive uh you don't know because i have it linked so that way you can't hear what i play through the computer but i was playing the uh, i was playing take on me as you were talking about that story i think 30 seconds is the limit for uh for free so i think we're good but uh <laughs> this whole app so this this kind of plays out like the original music video right so so there's a hand that comes out of this augmented reality sort of, uh, or, or, or this paper-drawn uh, hole in the middle of your living room, and you take the hand, and then, boom, a door ap- appears, and then you can sort of see your entire house or whatever room you're in um, in this sketch-like world. And you could go in the world and see everything as the sketch, but through the door, it's regular uh, reality, and then you can go through the door, and then the door becomes your window to the sketch reality and vice versa. It's hard to do it justice. Just look at this video. It's amazing. Um, So, uh, you know, I, I gotta go kick some ass with my own pipe wrench. Have you seen, (laughs) have you seen the, uh, have you seen that uh, literal take on me video? (laughs) where It's like, no, I haven't. Oh my gosh. Do, Do yourself a favor. It's a, it's a video describing the video that's happening and it's hilarious. Uh, you would love it. Um, no perfection. Yeah, no, this this goes to show like what what kind of uh as as small as these things are, you know, how how these cool little novel experiences will get people interested in VR and augmented reality and and sort of how um you know, it can bring it to the masses. Like everybody knows this video. Oh yeah, like every, and everybody's heard the song before, knows the video and I mean, it's it's crazy that just from a simple like AR kit that Apple's put together that it was able to be recreated at such a fidelity. Oh man, uh, yeah. Uh, I really have nothing else to say. This was one of those fun ones that we just kind of tossed in here. Uh, my last sort of point with this one, Blake. Are you able to hit that high note? 
oh no, there is no way. <laughs> right, let, me, let me see if I can get the high note going here. Hang on. Yeah, I got it. You can't hear it. Here we go. I'm going to try to hit it. Here we go. apologize everyone for your eardrums all right before i embarrass myself even more let's go ahead and move on to the next story blake <laughs> oh man okay so t- down a little bit of a different road to this back towards the south self-driving cars in legislature so a bill that would allow companies like ford google and uber to move more easily and test and deploy self-driving cars in the u.s on u.s roads insta head in congress on thursday after House lawmakers voted to send it to the full chamber for consideration. So it's still far from becoming a law, but as Democratic and Republican authors on the supportive House and Energy Commerce Committee believe their rare bipartisan proposal has a shot at success. As it stands, the safety, ensuring lives, future deployment, and research in Vehicle Evolution Act, a.k.a., the Self Drive Act would allow companies over time to test as many as a hundred thousand vehicles, uh, highly autonomous vehicles in the United States. So we talked a couple weeks, I think it's at least two weeks ago now, about the, kind of the well. I, I expressed some concerns I had with that some companies were getting like permits that were allowing them to put specific types of autonomous robots on the roads. Um, And in this case, we're talking about regulation of self-driving cars and the ability for big companies like Google and Uber and Ford um, to test these highly autonomous vehicles on actual roads. Right. Um, So the the, the biggest part about this is that it's actually moving through as, as slow as it can be with legislation. It actually is moving through. And that's just... It's great for these companies, at least, so they can start really deploying these vehicles and road testing them, getting them out there with real traffic and see how they interact. Right. And one of the one of the major hurdles for those um, for those companies that you're mentioning, the uh, tech and auto giants, right, is basically trying to prove that self-driving vehicles and, and technology is just as safe, if not safer than the vehicles that we have out there right now. Right. We have to, we have to sort of, <laughs> or, or they have to convince the government that the these uh, these vehicles should be exempt from sort of the safety requirements uh, that require them to have steering wheels and and uh, you know other other sort of challenges that they're facing right now. Which is really a big deal that it's like it's allowing people to or allowing these companies to kind of really skirt things from a federal level, uh, because that's a giant hurdle in and of itself. Um, And they talk a little bit about the local legislation as well from state to state. And the nice thing that I saw here was that states won't be able to really impose any regulations on their own targeting design and operation of these cars regarding mainly the software. So that means that it's really in the hands of... Uh, this this get this gets to be like a, a scary statement sometimes, but in the hands of companies that we do trust to make and test their own software, like Google and Lyft and Uber, mm-hmm. um, even though they collect a lot of data on us, it's still like very it's high quality software that's not being affected by any kind of like state agenda. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it'll be. I mean, we've talked about this several times about you know how how. This is this is important, and we want to keep our listeners up to date with the status of what's going on, right? We followed this as it went in, or as as even they were they were tossing around this idea of um, you know this bill. So to see it come this far is is a good sign of progress, and then we need to we need to get it over that vote, and then we need to see where it goes from there, and kind of what that does for us in terms of moving us forward with autonomous vehicles and autonomous technology on our roads. Uh, and and it, it'll be interesting to see for sure. Oh yeah. And as a kind of like a tie back to something that we did last week, we had somebody answer, hit us up with a Twitter question about the future of H F E and H C I. 
Um, and I, f- I feel like in this realm, if you're interested in automobiles and uh, any autonomous vehicles, and it's something that is talked about towards the end of this bill and the article, if if you're interested in getting into HFE or HCI, look into these car companies or Google or any of these app companies that deal with autonomous vehicles or will in the future and becoming and starting to try and tackle um, cybersecurity and what that entails as far as oh, yeah. what policies need to be in place, what kind of detail, what kind of data needs to be protected for drivers and while they're on trips and what should be transmitted, that kind of stuff is a good way to kind of figure out your way. Right. There's your, also like, yeah, there's also the whole field of transportation safety, human factors where, you know, they could get into the infrastructure side of things. How, how can we make road signs that uh, computer algorithms can read effectively? And how do we, you know, still provide hints and clues for the human uh, to stay in the loop despite not having, um, you know, their hands on the wheel at all times or whatever. There's, there's plenty of avenues. And like you said, like there's, there's a ton of different ways that you could go about it. But uh, this is definitely one of those uh, areas that are ripe for exploration in terms of human factors and implications for the human right now, for sure. Most definitely. All right. You ready to move to my favorite story of the week? It's your favorite story of the week. It's my least favorite story yeah. of the week. Let's do it. This one's crazy to me in so many ways. All right. So just like anything with a lithium-based battery has the potential to explode, just about any tech product that's considered smart is potentially hackable, which is why one clever hacker was able to break the Armatix IP1, a smart gun that was designed to only be fired by the person wearing a paired smartwatch. The hacker discovered that he could shoot the gun without wearing the paired watch by placing just $15 worth of strong magnets next to the weapon. He also managed to disable the weapon remotely by jamming radio signals so it couldn't shoot. Armatix has already caught wind of the hack and told CNN that when the gun was designed, quote, there was never the demand to avoid the usage by a well-prepared attacker or skilled hacker. Now, okay, so I said this is my favorite article, and this is kind of why. It's it's obvious that, one, I didn't know something like this even existed. Um, and I think the technology is kind of, is is in some ways necessary and kind of cool because it feels very futuristic, very RoboCop or Blade Runner to me as far as, like, you can't shoot the gun unless you have a smart watch on. And then, of course, you have the inevitable thing that somebody's going to figure out a way around the technology. But what really blew me away, and this is I have nothing against the company. I just think it's like a you have to think in, like, a QA testing type of mindset that they they designed this they designed a weapon that's a smart weapon but never really thought about the aspect of oh well what if somebody hacks this thing or can it easily be hacked that sounds like um, a cop out to me honestly yeah i, I think so I, well it sounds like it's it's just not or a major oversight built released and not well thought out yeah i i think the thing that makes this so scary is the fact that it is a gun right i mean we've seen devices get hacked before We've seen phones get broken into. We've seen uh, computers unlocked. We've seen, you name it, right? Any smart device, a Fitbit uh, can record whatever and transmit it to something else, right? We've seen all these things. This is a gun. This this can take somebody's life. And, uh, you know, depending on how you feel about guns, that's not what this is about. This is about the fact that uh, this system that was supposed to be designed for safety can be easily manipulated uh, to, in fact, have the opposite effect if the right conditions are there, right? I'm trying to skirt around this uh, politically, right? Because I don't want to upset anybody um, who feels that guns are a necessity or who feel that guns are not a necessity. And uh, I don't want to come down either way on that. So I'm I'm just trying to lay out the facts here and be as uh, politically neutral as I can. Oh, sure. And one thing to also point out is this particular hacker is also mentioned in the article. I mean, 
going about this would is not something normal people would do like getting fifteen dollars worth of strong magnets to test this i mean this is this is what what like hackers are known to do like figure right. out how to exploit a system um and th- it's unlikely that a lot of people would have figured this out on their own and it's, st- it's still i mean there's an easier way around this right instead of hacking a gun you can just buy a regular gun that doesn't require a smart band or anything like that so there's there's kind of tip for tat i mean the main point the main takeaway i had here in my mind is that as this this kind of thing gets more popular because I can only imagine that it will. Um, the companies need to be very careful in what they do in terms of testing for hacks like this. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, you know, this is by no means the optimal solution. I think this is just one solution and I don't know if there is an ultimate solution to gun safety, but it's something that, you know, uh, people will work for. I, I mean, I have colleagues who, you know, their pet project is gun safety. And so they are working actively to make these weapons safe, you know, whether, however you feel about them. The fact that yeah, they need to be, it's a tough one. Yeah. It's, the fact that they really need tough. to be safe and contained, I don't think anyone will have a problem with me saying that, that there at least needs to be some protection around them. Um, you know, whether or not you have them. So it's just, it's a, it's, it's a means to an end, and this is. Uh, I'm glad that a vulnerability was highlighted uh, before, you know, something fatal happened, or or that this was discovered in a different way. So, wow, Blake, why you made the show notes this week? Why'd you put this one as the last story? <laughs> this is really depressing, man. That's true. I don't know. I just thought it was. I th- I still think it's a step in the right direction in terms of making guns safer than they are at the current moment. Um, and, and I don't know, I think it's important for people to see things like this. And even the last story, I mean, we're talking about cars that are potentially going to have control of where you're going um, and a lot of data associated with that. And so understanding the hacks in these smart technologies is just something sh- people should be aware of. And we should definitely hold companies accountable and have them test and do much more intensive QA than maybe they think they're doing. For sure. Cybersecurity, folks, it's the way of the future. All right, man, you ready to see what came from Reddit this week? Let's see. All right, let's switch gears and get to the It Came From Reddit section. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about. Any subreddit's fair game, as long as it relates to human factors and encourages discussion among the community. So uh, today, our, uh, this is... This comes from This Is Fats, uh, and this was on the user experience subreddit, and they titled this Request from Stakeholder to Conduct Some User Interviews Internally. They go on to say, hello, folks. I recently started as a UX designer, and I'm currently working through my first project, which is so far a mixture of remote and in-person user research. So far, so good. However, it's been brought to our attention that some stakeholders want us to interview internal members of staff. More specifically, conduct the same usability studies we've been doing with the general public. Obviously, this this sets off alarm bells for a number of reasons, bias being one of them. I'd like to know if anyone else has been in this situation. My general impression is that this is merely for the appeasement of certain stakeholders. It's effectively an excuse in uh, or an exercise in futility. However, the positive aspect for me is that an opportunity to be more inclusive of other staff members' opinions and an opportunity to educate people on the benefit of user experience. Wow, that was a that was a long one, but uh, important one for sure. Blake, what do you what do you got on this one? Have you ever had something like this happen to you? Um, no, because. And he makes a good point, or he or she, we'll just go with this is Fats, makes a good point. I mean, you're, there's so much bias being introduced, typically, if you're like running them through a usability test of a product that they work on, or they're a part of building. Um, so likely they've already seen it before. But I, I guess what I took, took away from this, and I really like the, <coughs> sorry, the positive aspect that he spins this off at the end and it's really advocating for getting other people involved in what you do having maybe people understand 
what a usability test is, what you do as a user experience or human factors person in the company, how you're benefiting them. And also, too, I thought about this a little more because it, it did throw me off. And I was wondering if this is what he as he or she mentions, at like uh, exercise and futility. But I, f- I feel like, too, you have a chance now to understand from potentially different departments how how they perceive the product, what it does, and also does it do does their goals with using the product align with both their departments, like business goals, the goals of the customer that, you, that you've outlined through customer journeys or personas. So it, it gives you like a more whole sense of how people in different departments are moving in terms of building this product together. So I think it's a it's kind of unique. Um, now, Nick, I think you said to me before that you had experience with this. So let me let me uh, let me tackle a couple points here. Uh, first point. Wow, I don't even know where to start. Okay, first point. Half of being in user experience in the human factors field is evangelizing. You have to get out there. You have to let know people know what you're doing. You have to illustrate the importance of what you're doing. Um, right, like that's a that's a huge part of our job. If we're not in a company that appreciates uh, what we do and doesn't understand our importance, we have to communicate to that to them what that is. And this is a good opportunity to do it. When people inside the company, uh, this is Fats makes a great point where you know it's it's a it's an opportunity to educate people on the benefit of of user, user experience. That's point one. Point two. I know that some companies. I actually had a conversation with somebody just last week. Um, I won't say what company, but I do know that there are certain companies out there who will only use ability test within, right? Um, they only use people that they have access to, and this is in order or, or, or in, in, in an effort to make sure that there is no spillage out to the general public, right? They don't want their product um, getting sent out there early. So with that being said, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. It depends on your product, obviously, but um, if you've already done the research externally, it doesn't make much sense to do it internally. However, with that being said, um, you could, I I did work in a situation where, uh, you know, we had to recruit from within because our, uh, our sample of users was worldwide and we didn't have the means or the resources to actually go out to each site and sort of uh, gather knowledge about them. And so what we would do is we'd recruit internally with people who are familiar with the system, and uh, we would talk to them and solicit their feedback. And I think if the people that you're talking with internally know what they're talking about, and they should, I think this is a good opportunity for you to maybe iterate on some of these designs. Maybe use them to vet these designs. Maybe use them to... uh, you know, suggest new, I don't know, solutions to problems that you're experiencing. Um, This could be a great opportunity to sort of vet those designs though. And I mean, you don't really necessarily have to use it as a, uh, an interview or uh, usability test. But if you're, you know, thinking there might be another solution, run it by them. This is, this is a good, get them involved for sure. Uh, I, I would push back a little bit on the whole usability test because they're not actual users, but for sure, get them involved and, and you can, you can definitely get something valuable out of this. Honestly too, I feel like that if, cause it, he does call out that they're, they want them to conduct the same usability studies that they've been doing with the general public. And this might be a really good way, and I don't mean to sound sinister about this, but I've definitely run into this problem before. If you've ever worked with <clears throat> worked with a specific customer or company that they think that they know their customer base really well and that they don't need to do these studies, I mean, this is a great way to do a comparison of, okay, you've seen the designs, the in company you guys made these choices or wanted us to move in this direction but the studies we've done show that we need to move in a completely opposite direction with the product. So I, I think this is a really good way for you to like show utility, but also to help kind of course correct any 
any like biases that stakeholders do have about what they think they know about your customer base. Oh, so man. at the I, end, end of the day, I think this just really helps you out. I got to tell you, Might, I got to tell you, Blake, really quick before you get too far away from this, that whole sinister thing. And I, I had an experience one time where I showed a higher up a usability test of uh, a product that I was working on. And man, it was so frustrating for them to watch because you know, we'd put all this effort or they'd put all this effort into designing this thing. And there were some tweaks that we had suggested and, and they didn't get implemented. And then once they saw the usability test, they really understood it clicked for them. They knew, uh, you know, that, that we, we had our, our, our hunch was correct about what we needed to be done. And it was so amazing to see that switch because somebody higher up saw it. It was, it was amazing. All right. So I'm going to let you go ahead and finish your thought there. Sorry, Blake, I jumped in. No, 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 that's all good. That was kind of it. Like, I, I just think that there's more advantages to this than anything, uh, honestly. I mean, it might sound like a hassle as far as having to get stakeholders to uh, basically run through your usability test, but giving you, giving them exposure to what you do and also, to potentially giving you ammo if you run into a situation where they're trying to make a lot of design decisions that aren't necessarily warranted, this, uh, this could really help you out later. I agree. Well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. If you uh, have any stories or news topics that you think we may have missed, you can go ahead and follow us on social media. Let us know. Uh, Head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Uh, You can just join the discussion on our SoundCloud. Hopefully they don't go under. If they do, we have some... We have some uh, alternatives. Or you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail if you're feeling saucy at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us on our Patreon because we bring these things to you ad-free. So AHA can't sue us because we use more than 30 seconds of their music this time. All right, we're at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. We love those reviews. We love it when they're good. We love hearing from you guys. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Gardenstorff, thank you for staying up late and hanging out with me to talk about some human factors. Where can our listeners find you, buddy? Oh, no problem, Nick. You guys can always find me on Twitter at DontPanicUX. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter trying to be a little bit more active on there. I think I made one tweet in the last two weeks. I don't know. We'll see. At Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast, guys. Until next time, you know what? It depends on Oh, it everything. depends. Everything, man. We got the guns. Elevators Disney. for cars. Disney. Disney stuff. More Disney stuff. All right. See you next week. Bye.